Hello, I'm Terry Gilliam, and sitting opposite me is... Charles McKeown. And who are you, exactly? Um, good question. Um, no, carry on. No, Charles and I are responsible, and I think I'd like to blame Charles, most of all, for writing the script of Baron Munchausen. Uh, yes, you would, you would. Not surprised by that comment. <laughs> I just want credit where credit is due. Mm -hmm. Where it's done. And here we go, into the movie. Strap on your belts, hold tight. The Misadventures of Baron Munchausen. Prominent features. Is prominent features still around? Uh, no. Uh, it was going to call, be called Big Nose Films at one point, but we mm -hmm. settled for prominent features. The film opens with a great bay. This is in the south of Spain, near Almeria. This is where, in fact, uh, Sergio Leone shot a lot of his westerns, in fact, all of his westerns. However, what you see in the background is a painted city and uh, a lot of other painting. Now, this gets pretty violent very quickly. Uh, those cannons were real, weren't they? No, they were fake, but the four of them could actually fire. That was very useful. Yes, especially when people got out of line. What were we trying to do here? We were trying to state the state of the world in a sense. I mean, this isn't really about just 18th century, uh, wherever it takes place. It's it's about the world, isn't it's it? A, it's a broader statement, isn't it? Thank you, Charles. That's what I was looking for, a broader statement. People in despair, warfare, violence. These are these are the people of the world. This could actually be in Iraq today. This is a film for all time. Now, this was shot somewhere else, wasn't it? This is in a town called Belchite in Spain, which is interesting because it was a city that has now been retained as a monument to uh, the foolishness of war. The civil war in Spain destroyed this city. Uh, both sides took turns at demolishing it. And so it seemed to be a suitable place to shoot. It gave us a lot of ruins to begin with. And then Dante Ferretti, who designed the sets, could then add to that, add a few standing buildings, and off we went. And that horse, as I recall, is actually polystyrene, isn't it? It's, it's a very fine <laughs> polystyrene yes, example. Yes, please, please. People are paying good money for this, and I don't want to think okay. that big statues like that are just polystyrene. Okay, sorry. It, I won't mention that again. It's supposed to be bronze. In the background, you can see a hanged man. Huh. Interesting. Interesting. Uh, and as it was in those days, one took a long time dying, so there's a little somebody up there trying to bring his death about quicker by jumping on his shoulders. This was a really difficult shot because we were on a wire with a little trapeze underneath it and the cameraman was on that trapeze with the camera and uh, we had to pull it back literally by another wire um, controlled by men who couldn't see what they were doing. And we almost lost our operator a couple of times when it crashed into uh, the tower. Yeah, I remember that. I remember looking at that with some fear. Mm. This set was built inside of a soundstage in Chinichita in, in Rome that I believe had been bombed in the Second World War. So it was open to the sky. And uh, Dante thought this is the perfect place to build a theater open to the sky and a bombed one at that. And this was the first sequence to be shot, yes? Yes, this is where we began. I mean, we discovered our mistakes very early on because we thought we could shoot these night sequences at day with a big black plastic covering the top of the set. But it was so unbearably hot. I don't know if you remember that. We yeah, couldn't yeah. actually survive in it. Yeah. So we had to then take the top off and shoot it at night. I really love looking at that set. and Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Dante's people, Dante Ferretti again, was painting, we were painting on brown paper and then sticking it to uh, you know, backings. <laughs> and it got uh, this incredible quality of, of, of color and light. It's very soft, very yeah. Italianate. Yeah. Those rosy pinks are great, aren't they? Mm. It's beautiful. And Bill Patterson grasped the part with both legs, <laughs> teeth, everything. <laughs> Shameless. He did, he did. <laughs> has to be said. Do you remember this scene under under the, the floorboards? I hadn't until this moment. <laughs> and now it's all rushing back. Again, this brilliant set we couldn't move in. Once we got down there, we discovered that there wasn't room for us and the camera, much less the actors, but we managed to do it somehow. But I loved trying to do, in a sense, what one did in cartoons on stage with all the, the ancient um, equipment. 
stage machinery. I'd forgotten how good those waves look, actually. Mm. <laughs> but the idea was that here we're in this uh, embattled city under siege, and this is at least a troop of traveling players trying to entertain the victims. And wasn't that Valentina Cortese and... Uma Thurman? And Uma Thurman. Yes. Their first appearance. Exactly. This is, Uma was, I think, 17 years old when we were doing this. Uh, and this is, took this, this young gal out of the States and brought her to Rome. And, and uh, well, you've seen what's happened with her after. Well, she after said that. she was 17, didn't she? I mean. Ah, yes. Who knows? She could have been 35. She was very intelligent. That's the thing about Uma. I think Valentina is extraordinary because she was a great diva in a sense and a great um, star. When we were doing the post-sinking on the film, Valentina said that during the war when they made movies, the Second World War, they didn't have, weren't able to record sound. So they had to do all the post-sinking dialogue afterwards, remembering what they said and trying to match their lips without a guide track, which is really impossible to do. Yeah, well... And Sarah Polly had, uh, we found her in Canada. It's, it's interesting that both Sarah and John Neville were Canadians at this point. And she had been in a TV series called Ramona and was quite wonderful. I, th I'm, I was, having watched the film again, I realized I really cast her because of her teeth. You'll see that she's missing many of them. And it was just this <laughs> wonderful face. And some of these scenes we were shooting at night... At three in the morning, poor Sarah was asleep and literally Uma's holding her up in some of the shots and sort of kicking her to make sure her eyes stay open. And the first appearance of the nose. Of the famous nose that John Neville was forced to uh, endure for weeks and weeks and months, uh, unable to read, unable to do anything with a nose like that. I never appreciated that big-nosed people suffer these problems. Yes, the, the hamburger deficit. Please don't apologize, Mr. And Jonathan, who I think was secretly being Tom Stoppard, having been involved in Brazil with ah. yeah, Tom and all of us involved. And he developed a certain style of speaking. A certain pedantic. Mm. And it was a slight... How true. I hadn't realized, I hadn't noticed that before. You're absolutely right. Mm. I loved Bill arriving and putting his false nose on his forehead. I remember when we were shooting that, I was in tears laughing because it was such an absurd <laughs> image. Yes. And Sting yeah. came in for one night. Do you remember that night? Yeah, yeah. It was like, you know, the world had changed. A superstar had arrived. And if I was looking at some still photographs recently, and there's hardly any pictures of the rest of you. But there's me and Sting in, in a million photographs. Things are difficult enough as it is without these emotional people walking. But it's up. nice having, you know, friends in high places who will turn up occasionally. It is, although I remember sitting with Sting in the canteen the following day and he did look rather stunned. <laughs> he had come from a life of a superstar <laughs> and thrown into this nightmare, yes. which we were in at this point because we were already, every day we were getting another day behind uh, schedule. At the end of the first week, we were a week behind schedule. I, didn't, I don't know if this is possible, but that's what was happening because nothing was working as planned. And, this is uh, the first week, and how many weeks were we behind? Uh, we were behind a week at the end of the first week, and I think probably right. three weeks by the end of the second week. Okay. It was suddenly realizing we were in, you know, um, the Tower of Babel then, that everybody was speaking a slightly different language, even though the, the basic language seemed to be English. The ideas behind the world, words were completely different. <laughs> <laughs> Not unlike the Baron. <laughs> Indeed. I think that's what's funny about this thing, is that the making of it was very much like the story itself. This this disaster, this this nightmare situation, and this old lunatic trying to drag everybody through. I think I, I was getting blamed at being the old lunatic, even I was quite young then. <laughs> Watching it, as I did just recently, I couldn't believe that I believed we could do this film. And somehow the combination of me and Thomas Shuley, who was even the producer, who was even a bigger fantasist than I was, somehow we managed to get through this thing at the expense of most of the rest of you, I think. <laughs> You present me as if I were a ridiculous fiction, a joke. I won't... What I love about John Neville is there is a great actor who had sort of disappeared from the 
the stage and ended up, as he said, teaching Shakespeare to the Eskimos in Canada. And it was important to me to find somebody who was brilliant and forgotten. And that's what John was in reality. Uh, yeah, probably not forgotten in Canada. No, and he, I don't think he forgot himself either, but that was the other thing. He, but he'd, cho he'd chosen to disappear. And there was this sense of, you know, we set this in the Age of Enlightenment. And the Baron is really a Baroque character who believes in all the, the, the impossibilities of the Baroque imagination put into a world that is now rational. I think we were very much making a statement about Margaret Thatcher, weren't we? Oh, very likely. You remember that? Uh, yeah, I think you're right. Good. Okay. Thatcher's, Thatcher's Britain. That's what it was. Thatcher's Britain was under attack here, that everything was, you know, she knew the price of everything, the value of nothing. And I think Jackson was playing her and all the people around her. Uh, we've got a show to do. Oh, Lord. Actually, John Neville had a proper job, didn't he, at this time? Because he was running the, the theatre in Stratford, Ontario, in, in, Ontario. In Canada. In Canada. Yes. Yeah, he was... And you persuaded him to leave a perfectly sane, yes. decent, respectable job. And he's a very organised man, who, and he was running the place very efficiently, and he was then dragged into this nightmare world of Italy. What did you, so how did you do that? How did you persuade him to wreck his life for six months or whatever it was longer? Foolishly, he was a Python fan, oh. and he, I think okay. he thought I was something to do with Python as well. Right. And um, and it seemed like a good adventure. Like, for all of us, I think it was going to be a wonderful adventure, and like all adventures, they go terribly wrong. But somehow, I guess we all survived, didn't we? You're here, I'm here. Oh, the audience has left. <laughs> <laughs> They're the smart ones. Hey, brother, they've gone. <laughs> And there's Mr. Cooper, Ray Cooper. Ray Cooper, who has been involved in everything since Time Bandits. Uh, and Ray, one of the great percussionists, percussionists on the planet, chose to never speak. In the film, he nods, he's there behind Jonathan. They became a wonderful and, double act. And steals every scene. Exactly. I mean, Jonathan's working working madly away, and, and Ray's stealing. He does this on stage, too, when he played with Elton John and Eric Clapton. Yeah. He would usually steal he's the a, show. He's a scene stealer. They're, they're like that in our lives. And he will be punished. They all will be punished. One would like to think so. Mm. I'm delighted to say that I have no grasp... It was interesting to try to make these characters theatrical and... Uh, and a bit over the top. That's that's you in the background wearing those bizarre cardboard glasses that you yes. can't see out of. I, why was I? I can't remember why I was wearing them. That wasn't your choice. No, I, they were thrust upon me. No, I don't know where that came from. It may have been. It's either Gabriella Piscucci or, or Dante. I think it was Gabriella. Uh -huh. I don't think it was me. I take no responsibility for all the unpleasantness. I blame the Italians. You were just responsible for the head shaving. Well, there was that, but that was trying to make you feel comfortable because you all had to wear different aging makeup and different wigs, and it seemed to me sensible rather than going walking around in the heat of Spain or Italy right. wearing an itchy wig with its always coming unstuck. Yeah, yeah, thanks. So we spent months in Rome being pointed at in the street. But you were, you were revered as the men of Munchausen. We were making the most expensive movie since Cleopatra, and you had the mark of Munchausen on you. People wouldn't let us eat in their restaurants. Really? I thought that would guarantee a seat. Oh. No, you're much deluded. <laughs> well, I was trying so hard to make everybody feel good about the whole process. I remember this opening This opening scene was very interesting because Gabrielli had done such beautiful costumes and nobody wanted to make them dirty or bloody. And the first night I went doolally, insisting, no, we will not shoot until these costumes are destroyed. I think you're sort of in the forefront of destroyed costumes, aren't you? I mean, you do it, you destroy costumes better than anybody I know. And it's really important because they just look so much better when they've been destroyed. <laughs> it's, a, it's our secret. That's the secret of the, our success in films. <laughs> There's something about films that are always, especially, you know, something like a film like this, a, a fantasy film, which could all be very pretty and, and sweet and... To me, it was much more interesting to make it real. Mm -hmm. So we can do these incredibly beautiful images, and yet everything is tattered, everything is worn down by reality. And here comes my favorite shot in the whole movie. This was inspired by Bernini's Colonnade at St. Peter's. 
because you look from one... Oh, and it's a forest of columns. If you stand at the right point in front of St. Peter's, there's only one column in the colonnade around. You move off that point, you realize that they're about six columns deep. This scene now was originally going to be shot in the Alhambra in Granada. And Dante and I had gone there and measured every bit of the Alhambra, chosen the rooms we wanted to work in. And it was only on the tech scout when we've got only a couple of weeks before the start of shooting. The entire technical crew is out in Spain, flown to Granada, only to be told by the production supervisor, well, we can use the, uh, the Alhambra, but we can't have a horse in it. We can't use smoke in it. We can't have um, uh, dollies in it. All the things that were required for the scenes. And we were then buggered and had to tear up all of our drawings, all of our plans, completely throw the schedule out the window and start again and build this set in Rome. Uh, that was pretty much the, the constant battle during the film is we would ask for something, permission to shoot somewhere, be guaranteed that everything was hunky and dory. And then at the last minute, we would be refused permission. And so Dante and I had to design and replan and reschedule at least three major sequences. Uh, so was that shot after we come back from, from uh, Spain? I can't remember. Yeah, exactly, because we had to build that set after we came back from Spain. Yeah. What was interesting, the set, the set we'd just seen with the, the characters outside was on the back lot in Chinichita, and it was the tank, which we used later for the boats and all, and we just painted those great big red and white stripes, because actually Istanbul, if you go to Istanbul and look at the ancient walls, they are this sort of red and, 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 and white stones and these ridiculous stripes. Hmm. And we just were constantly pushing everything uh, to slightly cartoon level. So it's, it's, it's not reality. It's a very heightened uh, reality just, just under the fantastic. Well, this, of course, is real. Yes. And there's Eric, and he's already running towards Spamalot. Exactly. You can see him going. He knows his future. You he see how hard he's working. And there he goes to success, imminent success, just down the corner. It was interesting to try to make these sets look fairy tale like and yet believable at the same time. I think we failed on the believable part, but the fairy tale part is very successful. Yes, yeah, very nice, isn't it? It seemed important to make the world as fabulous as possible, to make it as rich and glorious. And I think watching the film, it's, it's the thing I still think we achieved. It's, it's just luscious hmm. and silly at the same time. This was a desperate moment because I was looking at the storyboards the other night, and we had, at this point in the, in the original script, uh, to while away the time while Berthold was gone, we had a giant chess game being played by the Sultan and the Baron and involving real elephants with towers on their backs. Everything was life-size, and as uh, a pawn was captured, of course, he'd be killed. A very big, expensive sequence, and at the last... And a week to shoot, probably. And a week to shoot, yeah. But somewhere along the line, we realized this was unlikely, and it was very much at the last minute. I think this, in fact, came out of the, the, the um, delay when... The film was closed down for two weeks, and we didn't know right. when we were moving ahead. So you think this scene is evidence of common sense breaking through? Ah, it's, you see, the film and reality are the same thing, aren't they? Uh, yes, this was common sense. No, I don't know if it's common sense. I think it was survival technique. Well, but it was, which can be common sense. What passes is common sense. <laughs> and Eric uh, Idle and, and, and Michael Kamen wrote this little operetta over the weekend. Uh, the Torturer's Apprentice, a eunuch's life is hard and nothing else. It seemed a good idea to have an executioner who was blinded. They were blinded. In fact, everybody you see in there, except for the eunuchs in the harem, are blinded um, because of the temptation of all those luscious women, which we try to make as luscious as possible and as meaty as possible. And succeeded. In fact, some of those women you don't notice aren't part of the set. They're human beings, but they're so fleshy. They get lost in the pinkness of the place. Gabriella was with her little hats for the eunuchs, I thought was quite interesting. That's for the, for the yes. adults and not the children. <laughs> But this set, I remember when we came back after the break when we were trying to survive, 
and arrived on this set, the painters were still painting in the morning. It was still wet, and I don't think we shot till the afternoon. Our horses had been trained by Tony Smart, the, the horse master, for about three months to do a variety of things, like running around in impossible places, leaping from windows. And it was, you know, just a couple of weeks before we just started shooting and all the horses were denied access to Spain because of a, uh, a plague that was there. That effect, that works very nicely, doesn't it? Because very the, nice. the model of the horse coming down is a really good one. He does, he flicks his legs out at the right time and the landing was uh, a real horse. It's really convincing. Yeah. That's you, Charles. It That's is. your first close-up. No, as, as, as the young you. You were young then, weren't you? I was, and you could see why I was barred from certain Italian restaurants. <laughs> There's Jack Purvis from Time Bandits, Winston Dennis from Time Bandits also. Oh, this old friends gathering together in Rome. That's a nice thing you did there, that jump. Yeah, do that? I had to work really hard to do that. You know? <sighs> Should uh, we tell I... the world how that was done or no. not? No. Okay. They paid good money for this, this commentary. They were supposed to be revealing secrets. And the gun? What about the gun? It was really heavy. That was iron, the gun, solid iron well, gun. You caught that effortlessly. I was younger, as you said. <laughs> the leap actually is done backwards. A stuntman, that wasn't you, it was a stuntman who did that. He leapt off and did that funny little twist, and then we shot it backwards. Thanks. There you go. I love this little set because it is really like fairy tale films of the 50s. And we actually built that set with a little track that could spurt dust as he roared away. The foreground part that Eric was standing on is shot on a green screen stage at a completely different time. And you will agree. It's either you or me. And this idea of the Baron getting younger and older, where did we come up with that idea? Because it's not in the original Rasp stories, is it? Uh, no. No, I, I've forgotten, but it caused a lot of trouble, didn't it? I mean, it was... Well, Maggie, my wife, who was you know, in charge of the makeup, uh, had done a beautiful map of uh, what age he's supposed to be and what costumes he's supposed to be wearing. And it went... It, it actually, it was fine up until uh, the day we shot the scene towards the end in the Sultan's tent. And either I or somebody, I think I'm getting the blame for it, said the wrong thing. But they shouldn't have listened to me anyway because it was on a piece of paper what was correct. And they put John in the wrong costume and makeup four hours of doing the wrong thing. I love this shot. The idea of perfect timing down to the last little moment. Yeah. Thanks. I needed a trim. Peter Jeffries is, is quite wonderful as the Sultan. He's a, he's a very unlikely uh, Turk, but he had a large nose, so I thought we were <laughs> off. <laughs> he didn't need an artificial nose like John Neville did. Uh, well, you were trying to save money, I think, weren't you? Was that it? Oh, that's yeah. why Peter got the job. That's right, because he had the largest nose yeah. in British uh, actordom. Treasurer! Allow I sent here to take from the treasury as much as the strongest man can carry. This kind of storytelling, I think, isn't done very often these days because on one hand, it's like a good old fairy tale. And yet it, it's a bit more sophisticated than that, I think, isn't it? Yes. The and, <laughs> and somehow more, it's kind of weightier, meatier or something. It's a... I think it's about something. We're trying to talk about, you know, the need for fantasy, the need for imagination, and uh, how it, you know, can inspire, and also how it can make people younger. Yeah, I think the age thing came from my experience with Fellini, having met him when he was uh, making one of his films, and Jonathan and I were down there promoting Brazil, and he was like a giant of a man. And then uh, Dante and I bumped into him uh, when we were preparing... Munchausen, and uh, he was in between films, and suddenly he was this very frail old man. And then while we were making Munchausen, he was shooting Intervista outside of, in fact, my office most of the time to keep me imprisoned. And he was suddenly a giant again. So it's something about, you know, yeah. work and imagination you know, can change your age. 
Most of this was ad-libbed, I believe, at the moment. Let me do this. <laughs> John has got the most wonderful, you know, perfect smile. <laughs> yeah, he's been rejuvenated, hasn't he, by all of this? Mm. I'm often curious for the audience when they're watching, because we don't actually comment on that. No. If they notice it immediately, mm -hmm. or whether they think it's a mistake. <laughs> and again, you know, so you can do violence that also has a comic end. Oh, and you go cheap jokes like that with people blindfolded. <laughs> Actually, I mean, our characters, the group of four, are just wonderful because they're all sizes and all shapes. A freak show, as, oh, as, 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 Win as Winston said. As Winston said, yeah. Winston was wonderful because here's somebody who had never really acted in the film, who had been a big, just a big guy. He was in uh, Time Bandits as the, he played the Minotaur and, um, and, the, and also a man with a big sword at one point. And then we got him into Brazil he was inside the samurai costume. And this was a chance for him to really to be an actor. And he's just the sweetest giant on the planet. Mm, yeah. <laughs> and Jack Purvis just got better and better in each film. Hey, Eric, of course, was always mediocre and never got any better. But well, we had to lower the standards so the rest of you look good. Yes. Do you think he'll play that part in the musical? Ah, uh, you know, there is talk about trying to do a musical with Munchausen. Yeah. Yeah, just between the two of us in yeah, this room. Yeah, we won't yeah, mention it to him. We shouldn't even talk about no, it. We should better move on. Yeah. But did you notice that thing, the way this transition, how he made the transition from the fantasy into back into the theater with bits of theatrical flats falling into it? Yeah. Nobody knew what was happening when we were shooting that. And I kept saying, throw another one of those things in there. And we didn't have time to explain what we were doing during a lot of this shooting. I, watching it again, it amazes me just how many explosions we seem to have. It's a very violent film. Everything is blowing up all the time. It's a great transition back into the theater. Right? And suddenly we're back with an old baron. And our characters are no longer looking glamorous. They're looking, you know, just cheesy wigs. I've always loved Eric's big padded uh, thighs. And, and <laughs> all of his nether regions, everything below the waist is well padded uh, for that character. And this scene with Bill Patterson, this is him ad-libbing his uh, reviews, and it's breathtakingly wonderful. When we were shooting it, I was in tears once again because it wasn't expected. He'd gathered all these little pieces of tiny pieces of ratty paper in his pocket. Look, and those last two <laughs> fingers held out, is holding this thing so preciously, so, so delicately. Yes. The moment, the, the moments of his triumphs. The, the review from the Glasgow Herald. <laughs> A good night out. <laughs> and that was Bill ad libbing. It was wonderful. I think that's the part that is great when you know one's got a good collection of good actors and, and allows space for ad libbing, which. Unfortunately, on, on Munchausen, there's very few of those moments mm -hmm. one, could, one could really let go because it was technically just so complicated. This is the moment I love when we go into the, the, the collapsed theatrical sets and it becomes, to me, absolutely magical. We move into this place and it's just so... What's going on? It's dark. It's incredible. You don't know what's three-dimensional, what's two-dimensional, what's real. I think those kinds of transitions, I was really pleased with. Again, we kind of faked it on the night. We had all this gear there, and we just sort of dragged things into, into position. The death that Richard Conway and his uh, men created is, I think, really spectacular. The wings, the way they work, the whole, mm -hmm. the whole creature is, is terrifying and, and spooky. And we used this music that was basically inspired by Rachmaninoff's uh, The Isle of the Dead, which is so strange because it's in 5-8 time. And it, it's like it doesn't settle. It's just <gasps> like your stomach is churning. It's just another stage set. What's real and what isn't in this film? This is beginning to bother me now. I, as the audience, want to be told clearly what is imagination and what is factual reality. Thank you. 
Sarah was absolutely wonderful. She just dove in and had a wonderful, wonderful mouth of teeth. That's what you think. <laughs> and the people and, and the people understand the the hourglass being knocked over. I often wonder. Yeah. This idea, because the, the hourglass keeps playing in the film. We've yeah. had it in the Sultan's yeah. Tale, and we've had yeah. it there. Yeah. I like very much his pocket hourglass, the one he checks. Yeah. I don't know if one of those ever existed, but it seemed like no, a nice no, little that's invention that you yeah. carry with you. I'm tired of the world. The world is evidently tired of me. This is always like this speech. And I just like their relationship. It's the beginning of a great love affair. Casablanca for, you know, expanded relationships. <laughs> She looks very good, doesn't she? And well, that's what's wonderful about her. I mean, you just move in tight like that, and it's just a, just an absolutely wonderful face. These incredible eyes. Yeah. And she doesn't have to do much. She just can be very dreamy. And then she opens her mouth, and her teeth are all over the place. Uh, the thing about teeth, if you notice the Baron's teeth, they're pretty ratty as well. I think that may be the, the, the common attraction between the two of them. English, it's a dental thing. English teeth. Exactly. As an American, that was, I mean, the joy of coming to England and finding real teeth as yeah. opposed to Rock Hudson and Doris Day's perfect teeth. I do. I thought we were somehow getting back to reality, to something that was... Uh, a land without orthodontists. Exactly, part of a greater continuum. The uh, modern continuum of New Jersey dentists is not going to last. Please. You really want to know, don't you? It's always just interrupting these moments with a bit more bombardment. It's a good way out of every yeah, sketch. Yeah, we just didn't know how to finish the scene, I suppose. That's right. Well, this was this came from Python. We never we gave up punchlines, and um, so this is another way of avoiding the punchline of a scene. Yeah. Start a bombardment. That swinging chandelier is very good. Yeah, I think uh, if you notice that chandelier dropped earlier, and I, I believe Andrew Lloyd Webber stole the same that idea from us for oh. um, Fan for the Opera. Oh, really? Yeah, because a chandelier drops in that one, too. And I think, I'm not sure if we have a patent on dropping chandeliers, but... Well, mistake if we didn't get one. I know, well, it was bad production all the way along, and they probably didn't manage that one. Sarah claims to have had a terrible night, this night, running through all that explosion, that she was terrified. But she was such a pro, She's never mentioned that to me except when she does you know, interviews with the press about her abuse as a child actress. Right. But she was a real trooper. Because that this evening was probably one of the most adrenaline-filled evenings because I just had this, this confrontation with the completion guarantors and I put my fist through the windscreen of my car. Oh, I remember that, yeah. And it just, we really got more done that night than on any other day or night of the shoot. <laughs> now this is, you know, we've cut this scene out here, and uh, I think we'll be putting it on the extras, which might explain why when these Don answers with Wednesday, we understand okay. it. Yeah, so this is now half a joke. It's half a joke. Now, the question is, does the film benefit from losing a very funny scene uh, because it sort of keeps the focus on the Baron and Sally without the interruption? Michael Kamen, the composer, always thought it was a mistake, and you've told me today that the Germans were yeah, very disappointed. They were. And it was probably the best, best of your writing that we cut out as well probably was and i think maybe half a joke is not better than no joke at all but we were trying to move into serious filmmaking and leave comedy somewhere behind but yeah that was a decision taken on this occasion yeah. before we reverted do we go back to comedy later I on i think we probably did as things got rougher during the shoot i think we had to rely on comedy just to keep the cast and crew happy again the death see again if one did the cg it wouldn't be as impressive. There's something about a real model or a real physical thing flapping its wings that 
that is surprising. If you animated it, it wouldn't be as strange as that. Yeah. It'd be much probably neater, more concise, more beautiful possibly, but not as real. And there's something that I think the audience, you know, understands. Yeah. That's really very good, isn't it? That scene? Yeah. Well, thank you, Charles. Works that really. Yeah. God, nobody's ever said that to me, at least this closely. <laughs> and the moment here again is that the re reveal for the little girl and the audience that it really is, and then we wipe out the uh, the the witnesses that might back up their tale of the flying baron. That's it. The end. It's all over. Generations of theatrical expertise. Laughter. I love Bill because he's shameless. It's an over-the-top, <laughs> just outrageous performance. But he does it with utter conviction. And I think that's the key to... Uh, Surviving the embarrassment of some of these scenes. <laughs> the, the actor has got to grasp it with both hands. I think uh, Bill had got the measure of this movie very early on. Yeah. What I always loved about it, he really was Henry Salt. He was bossing everybody around. He was in that character 24 hours a day. Yeah. I think it was a dream come true for him. He always wanted to be, a, I think, a theater manager, an actor manager. Yeah. And I think once he got that wig, you know, there was no... Mm. Stopping him, really. He jumped onto a cannonball. He really did. And he flew miles up into the sky above the elephants and swords. Somebody was asking me the other day about uh, when the Baron seems to deny Sally's tale of his flight. And the point of, I don't know, and I can't remember why, at which point we became obsessed by the pedantry of the, the Baron. That if you're going to tell his stories, you have to tell them precisely, word perfect almost. Because anything, even a word off, is a lie. It's not accurate. Yeah. Now you're lying. I never lie. And I just thought it was a nice moment that he then very pedantically explained exactly what it was he did, as opposed to flying. I didn't fly miles. It was more like a mile and a half. And I didn't precisely fly. I merely held on to a mortar shell in the first instance, and then a cannonball on the way back. You maniac! You've done for us! That's it. it. doesn't matter whether you thrown out or stay here. The Turks are about What to... I can never tell is, is whether we really maintain the pressure of the siege on the whole thing, mm. whether the audience is wrapped up in that or not, or whether it's just a, yeah. uh, an idea more than anything. Yeah, I think it's difficult to... Probably doesn't altogether come through that pressure all the way. I think it's very hard because on one hand we're doing a very episodic piece with yeah. these very these set pieces that go a long yeah. way and trying and, to disguise it. Yeah, exactly. And it's it just it's 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 sort of an intellectual idea as opposed to an emotional one. You don't feel for the audience. You don't feel for the town. You don't feel the threat of the uh, characters. I can't remember whether we had something more of the, you know, the theatrical troupe during the siege later, later on, the, the, the troubles they were in. I think we talked about it once upon a time, but it never ended up yeah. in there. In the interest of all the Russias, whose hand in marriage I once had the honor to decline. They all remind you. Because everything about it is rather theatrical, the whole piece. I think you've got to, the audience has just got to go with it if they expect the normal kind of... Um, action film with all the you know the car chases and all that and caught up in the, the storytelling it doesn't work it's just you go to another place and have another adventure and then you move on from that one to another adventure yeah and that's a form that isn't really used anymore <laughs> maybe for good reason wonder why not <laughs> Say just tell us what to do kindly be so good as to remove your knickers <gasps> Oh. 
The wonderful thing about Valentina is she always knew where the center of the frame was. She was an old pro, and I remember at one point I was getting lots of complaints from the rest of the cast because she would use elbows, she would step on toes to make sure she was in the crosshairs of the camera. She was absolutely extraordinary. <laughs> And what I do remember is, I remember on the first night we were in the theater, she arrived with some handmade brasaula that she had made herself just for the director. She was a pro. She knew how to get close-ups. <laughs> <laughs> what a wonderful. <laughs> Lovely, intimate things. I was looking at the, the longer cut of the film. We did have a shot of the, the siege, a, a few shots of the siege between his line asking for their underwear and the balloon. Uh, to keep, again, the pressure on. It's interesting because this version is about five minutes shorter than what was really my final cut. And it was under pressure from the studio to get it down to two hours and then they would be behind us all the way. And they stayed a very long way behind us after that. I didn't realize what they were doing. It was the first, it was really the first time I've compromised um, to keep the studio on our side. And it still rankles because those extra few minutes are small, but they do help the film. They just, it doesn't, the film isn't destroyed by any means and no ideas are lost, but it's just little bits of pacing and little moments that... Was that one of them? Was that a moment you would have preferred to have left material in between... It, Exactly, because it just it kept, uh, we're back into the battle, and it, it brought the, 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 the siege right in our face. And the cut works perfectly, but it, it just kept that kind of pressure on. And I think that may be one reason why one doesn't feel it. And there were also, in between that, there was another uh, shot of the, uh, of the soldiers marching off. No, no, there's the shot there. I lie. We didn't cut it out. Thank God the film still works. <laughs> Oh, it's breathtaking now. That balloon was a real, real little gem because it's held up by a crane. And we had to keep trying to get this thing floating in the air. And for a big crane to do that was very difficult. I remember on the, on the day because we were slightly out of control. Yeah. And you were being dragged around by those ropes rather realistically. I mean, it was happening because we couldn't quite get the operator to, to float the thing up and down. And we were in the middle of this very complicated scene. And I remember looking up onto the stage, and there was our producer, Thomas Shuley, with his back to all of us, all the extras, with a documentary crew doing a piece on him. We were background action <laughs> to the producer's career. Stop! You're under arrest! Let go! I love that little boat. I mean, one of the great things about the film is the art department. We had three different, basically, prima donna sculptors who wouldn't speak to each other. Each had their own studio building the different elements. And the boat was one of them. The big equestrian statue was done by another one. Um, later on, the bed on the moon was done by a third. And they were all, they were all brilliant, utterly brilliant, but would not admit to the existence of the others. <laughs> The dog was given to me as a birthday present. Yeah, I remember. Yeah, Bryn. Now the, How long did you have it for? Until he died, uh, until Maggie had him put down. <laughs> I mean, several, a lot, a lot of years. The, the problem, the extraordinary thing with the dog was that they're, they're lurchers and they're poachers' dogs, and they're trained usually by poachers not to bark, so they, they sneak around the place. And we needed them to bark, so they had to be retrained to bark. So we probably had the most neurotic animals on the planet. Again, the storyboard part of this sequence was a much more elaborate one because she fell and was caught on a steeple of the, of the yeah. church. And then we had a long sequence of the Baron you know, rescuing her. And again, this is one of the other cuts early on when we re as, as the production was proceeding and nothing was actually getting ready on time. We wanted to keep trimming. And I think this works fine. It's just, it's... We, we ran out of time again because this was when the film was closed down in Spain after six weeks of shooting. And I said, you've got to continue. You've got to keep letting us finish this particular scene. Yeah. 
there, which they wouldn't. And we had to do all that back in Rome, and it was everything was a bit of a mess. The battle was pretty spectacular. This was actually shot at Belchite, but then this part was shot down in Almeria, uh, at Cabo de Gato. This whole battle sequence was put together the night before because we weren't supposed to be shooting any of this in uh, Almeria. We were supposed to be shooting it all in Belchite, but we didn't have any of the principal actors' costumes due to this custom strike in Barcelona. And we literally put together that battle with the only costumes we had uh, for the next day and shot it. Again, we were having a nightmare with this crane that was supporting the balloon to swig it out there. Everything was quite difficult, but it worked in the end. Yeah, yeah. And it's kind of a turning point in the movie as well, isn't it? Um, Getting the balloon to fly. Constantly. Yeah, that became kind of symbolic of yeah. everything that we were doing. Yeah. And I remember that happening just as... The irony was that getting the balloon to the fly it was the last thing that happened before they closed the movie down. So one minute we were elated. We actually got the balloon into the air and off we went. And film finance closed the movie down. And we were all sent back to Rome. And you and I had to cut, 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 try to work out. And they didn't want us to go to the moon. We got the balloon in the air, but we weren't allowed to go to the moon is what they told us. <laughs> and what did we do? I remember sitting there and saying, well, let's, they get to the moon, they open a door, and it'll be just our office with us sitting around talking about what we were going to do. And you, at this point also, I was saying, I just want to go home. I just want to leave. And then you became the Sally in the piece, <laughs> saying, you know, you've dragged us all here to Rome. You've, you can't you've, do this to us now. <laughs> you've put us through hell. You've made our lives an absolute misery. Yeah. And now you're going to run off and go home? Yeah, it just wouldn't... That would be a poor show. <laughs> and so we sat down and we worked out how to save the moon by reducing it from 2,000 to 2. It just removed three zeros is all we did. That's easy. Yeah. Anybody can do that. You'd think it would be done more frequently, wouldn't you? I mean, well, accountants were doing it all the time as far as the budget went. <laughs> and it kind of it worked. Shooting all of this stuff, I remember with the, it's a little model, but we were then in, in stage five at Shinichita with the, with the, uh, the little boat and our cotton wool um, clouds behind us. And what we discovered is that the, the roof supports of the stage wouldn't support a little balloon like this and his little boat. And we had to bring in this huge crane, which then I think we discovered the floor wouldn't support the crane. And we eventually did it, but this uh, went on and on and on. And poor John, I think, was so tired at this point of the whole thing, and we're dousing him with water and shaking him about. And it was... But he's a real hero, John, to have put up with all of this nightmare nonsense. It looks okay, though. It looks very good. And the little model works very well with the, the great tidal waves in the tank. And I like that the big moon that we built in the background. The models were now shot by Roger Pratt because uh, we pulled all the special effects stuff. It's one of the reasons, one of the ways we kept the film alive is by appearing to be on schedule by pulling out all the special effects to be done in post back in London. This is one of my favorite shots in the whole movie, which I had no idea it would prove to be so beautiful because we had this big, big kind of tank uh, that we filled with water and with sand underneath, sculpted, and then let the water drain out as the boat pulled forward. And I remember setting up that shot and looking at it and then saying, oh, let's put more stars in the sky. And, and it was one of those things that all of us, as we were shooting it, realized, God, that's beautiful. Yeah, and it's, I, I never knew how you did that, actually. I really? Yeah, I didn't. No. Well, it's that little boat. If you actually look, this is for the people who've paid good money for this DVD. If you look ahead of the boat, I don't know if we should tell them. It'll ruin the illusion. But if you look ahead of the boat, you'll see a fine line in the sand. And it's where the wire was that was pulling the boat forward. But basically, we had this tank that the water had to drain out through the sand. And it was not a simple thing, but it, it it's very elegant. We now get into our moon sequence where 
we had to make this huge cut. Not only did we cut from the original script, but now at the end of the shoot of the film, we had run out of money. And we had built that orrery, but we also had designed, Dante and I had designed these huge uh, buildings, these flamboyant buildings that were all going to be built in 3D. And we had no money, so all I did is blow up the drawings, color them in with felt tip markers, put them on little sliding um, rails, and pull them back and forth. And I think it's better than our original ideas. It's magical. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the whole moon sequence is, it was very instinctive for what we were doing, cutting everything down, simplifying, and ending up making something as, it's a nice kind of intermission from all of the 3D richness of the piece. Originally, Sean Connery was going to be playing the King of the Moon when it was this Cecil B. DeMille sequence, but having reduced it down to this Cartesian dualism, um... We were in a different situation. Mike Palin was supposed to be playing the Chamberlain under Sean, and then I offered Mike the part of King of the Moon. And we were... This is all during the period when we were not shooting, when we were trying to survive. And Eric Idle said that Robin was quite interested, and we knew the studio would be much more excited about Robin playing the part. And I think we kept the whole show afloat by sacrificing my best friend Mike some discomfort another fallen person another body i think i got the blame for that didn't i, I think you blamed me did i yeah that's that's why one works in combos yeah exactly exactly but robin williams was fantastic what are you blind what i love the fact is you know that he ad-libbed so much more than just what was written there and, and in, in this instance i think his ad-libs are really good very good is now ruling and governing but what was ridiculous is that his managers were so convinced we were going to be selling the film on the back of robin's reputation that robin doesn't get a credit on the film and when it came to the credits he's down as ray de tuto <laughs> king of all <laughs> but i love the way he could grab bits of italian and throw them in there and and and, and they all work and it i think it was his desire to be a little bit like uh, Valentina. She had an Italian accent, and so we pushed the whole thing into this weird Italian moon. And it's, it's again, it's this rather Baroque thing with his, you know, this ionic capital for the top of his head. His ironic capital, did you say? Aha! Uh -huh. I wish I was funny, but I'm not anymore. Thank God you're here. <laughs> So I am... But we had this ridiculous rig he was stuck into that we wiggled all over the place while he was strapped in. <laughs> I was very pleased with this little thing where as you slide off the center, because uh, you realize the floor isn't quite attached to the walls. It's one of those, another one of those shifts. Yeah, it's a nice surprise. Uh, and what we had to do with the sets, because again, this great framework of this, uh, this great curved uh, section, this was going to be the basis for the big amphitheater that was in our original version of the, the moon sequence with thousands of people dining. And we built that part of it. So, well, we used it and we just turned it into a kind of, it looks like a scientific thing with markings. And we had just, again, cut out uh, photographs of drawn buildings stuck up there, so it's it's a kind of storage place of all sorts of architectural ideas. I despise you. Let me go. No, no, no! At the last moment, we decided to make it work. That his face becoming red worked very nicely as the bloody suffuses it. And I'm gonna use them, baby. <laughs> Poor Valentina didn't realize what she was getting involved with. And, and Robin is a madman. And she was absolutely fantastic at dealing with him. I think the, the strangest thing was when we see her entrance with his headless body. That was one of the last things that was shot. And it was Valentina's last day. And the, the person playing um, Robin's body was this small woman who 
went crazy in there. And, and Valentina was so disturbed by being groped by a woman in a headless outfit <laughs> that she was practically in tears. And it was also on the same day, there was a, a, a um, I think, a, a Swiss documentary crew doing a whole piece on her. So she's practically in tears being groped by a headless woman being photographed by a Swiss uh, documentary crew. I did buy her the biggest bunch of roses I could find to try <laughs> ease the pain. Here you go, lovebirds. I'm sure you'll be very uncomfortable. <laughs> I am free again, free to concentrate on higher things. <laughs> I love this set again. We'd run out of money, so it's such a simple set. It's hardly anything there. A couple of walls and a and a and a grill, and it's. It, it actually reminds me of some early early films by you know Pasolini and people uh, that were designed so severely and simply. It's it's the most Italian part of the film, I think. Uh, de Cara de Caracasque. De Caracasque it is, which is absolutely right, which is very much like the moon. We ended up because we didn't live in our buildings, it was you know, sort of this this vast empty moonscape with just objects sitting in it. Uh, it's a strange world of just artifacts left behind from dreams, probably, of the king. His more megalomanic moments. He he would build incredible things and forget about them as his head would take off. The page isn't real. It's just part of the king's lunacy. It seems solid enough to me. I see we're in a not very helpful frame of mind. How are we supposed to save the town from here? The town is perfectly all right. The present assault is over. Everyone is quite safe there. How do you know? I just know. I mean, when I look at these battle sequences, I can't actually believe that we shot basically most of it in one day. Is it really true? Yeah, the huge fight with the, the, the army was one day we had to shoot it. We just shot like mad people, five cameras. We went berserk. There are other shots that we then shot later at Belchite. But the vast majority were done in one day. On the beach. On the beach. The beach that we learned to love. Because everything went wrong on that beach. Yeah. I beg your pardon. I thought you might be unfriendly. Of course. Now, Maggie, my wife, has never forgiven me for letting Eric talk his way out of wearing the extra little bits of hairs that soften his wig. He get he got difficult. And Maggie has accused me many of times of letting the film completely collapse over Eric's wig. Well, I think she's right. Thank you. Thank you. I, look at I apologize that. to the world. Just look at it. Well, I think, I mean, luckily, P Pepino's lighting it darkly. We're almost able to survive. I think Maggie had had a word with Pepino, probably. Yeah. Yeah, I know. It was an interesting one, because Maggie basically designed everything, and Fabrizio Sforza... Um, dealt with the the actual doing of it, and Fabrizio was absolutely a genius. Help us fight the Sultan! Get off! Get off me! You're Berthold! Now, I was asked earlier, why is Eric in the film? Why did we cast Eric? Do you remember? Um, well, I think we thought he... We knew he'd be good. Ah, it wasn't that we knew eventually he would be the richest python because of the success of Spamalot, and that it would be good to have friends that are rich. Can we claim this degree of prescience? Why not? Okay. <laughs> prescience, there's not enough of it about these days, and especially with Christmas coming up. I'm sorry. I could not speak for you before, but Roger's so difficult. <laughs> Where exactly is Roger? I think this was interesting for a children's film, because this was in many ways meant for all the family. And such you know, rampant sexuality in a children's film, but I think I think we get away with it because just like Sally, children don't really understand what no, we're talking in, in about. In fact, we're so oblique; even I don't understand it. Ah, but you're just getting older. Oh, that could be the answer. <laughs> that could be. We all forget. We do. I thought that was rather sweet. These scenes. I think it's you know. I think at the time. There was noise from certain quarters higher up that this was, you know, 
pushing the envelope a little bit too far oh, for yeah. a family film. But I think we did it very tastefully. Yeah. And I think Valentina is very good. I find that really magical, our, our, our flat city. And I'm looking back at just amazed that we were able to make the most out of, you know, losing one of the major sequences of the film. Oh, I love this. I and again, you know, for all the people, the adults that were worried that her orgasmic sounds had something to do with sex, here it is, just tickling your feet, yeah. as the Baron had said. He never lies. And I think most of the parents probably felt very embarrassed for having thought sexual thoughts in front of their children. It's actually quite... How long is that sequence that we're in sequence? It's not, it doesn't feel like a sort of vestigial sequence, does it? It feels... No, it like actually... Proper, it has a proper weight to it. I think so. I mean, that's what I like about it. I mean, I think probably the original idea was just absurd to try to do such a big sequence on the moon because I think it probably would have completely taken over the film. Mm. This actually seems quite tidy. And it's... I do like just the visual break from the clutter of earlier sequences to suddenly just come and using, and literally like this, this bit of molding, this giant molding, we had built these pieces so they had already been paid for and we couldn't be talked out of simplifying the moon even, even more. And so Dante and I just used what we had and stuck it in this empty landscape. And it seems to work. I mean, it's that awful thing that always happens in every film we've done is being forced into a corner where you've got to take out what seems to be such a, a vital part of the movie and you end up with something that's probably better for the whole film. Darling, I'm going to drive you to China. Let it out. This bed, I've never understood how anybody could sculpt, much less design a bed like that. It involves so many swirls and curlicules and volutes. And that's why the Italians, probably only in Italy, could people make something like this. They have the skills and the, and the knowledge. I hope people understand why he's wearing this thing over his head. <laughs> it's clear to strap his head on so it doesn't take off. It looks like some sort of from some pastry shop where you <laughs> you wrap some pastry and carry it home safely. Again, using very wide-angle lenses, it looks like a, a huge set, and it isn't. I think Michael Kamen's music for this sequence is really nice. It's very silly. It's just... It's this little uh, military bump, 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 bump. It's an oom pa pa thing, but it, it it was it was kind of designed to be kind of like the clockwork Griffin, three headed Griffin. It's already some sort of weird clockworkness going on. Hmm. Come on, ah! Ah! Robin was there for one week and and we were supposed to be shooting this Griffin thing very early on and it wasn't ready and it was literally on the very last day he was there working well probably right up to his flight out trying to get the Griffin to work and because it ended up being fake looking it didn't look as real as it was an intention it was supposed to be a real animal I decided well let's just make the most of it and turn it into a clockwork creature that can justify its less than perfectness. I don't know why they have asparagus on the moon, do you? Uh, I have to ask the Baron that question. Ah, okay. okay. Well, that was Rasper's story, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Did we do anything on this, or is it all from Rasper? I think it's all pretty much from Rasper, really. It's about... hardly an original. Really? Well, it, luckily he's dead, so he can't claim anything. Yeah. yeah, good, yeah. Now, when did we actually work on the structure of, of this idea of a theater in a town under siege? Because that's, that's what we did. I think those are 
the form that we thought that it would give it some shape. There would be, you know, a yeah. pressure under yeah. the whole uh, whole film. I think that was fairly early in the process, wasn't it? It had to be. It started yeah. with that. Yeah. Uh, I'm free. I'm free at last. The body is dead. The body is dead. Long live the head. It's finished. Finito. <laughs> Bye, body. See, and I can't remember whether we scripted this business about the nose and the itch. Oh, that was Robin's. That's Robin. Ad lib. That's Robin's ad lib. And he was so amazing um, in that stuff. Yeah. Because that's right. Then he did that. And then I thought, well, if he's going to do that, we can do the sneeze, which takes care of him. I can't remember how he originally did it. I actually like the fact we've got a huge giant feather floating down in the background. It was this business of trying to keep the scale going. Baron Munchausen, how great to see you. Well, what are you doing here? Get off me. It's me, Berthold, your old servant, Berthold, remember? Yes, yes, we've been through all that. Sarah can do these wonderful deadpan looks. Yes, she's looking older already. Yeah. <laughs> she's... <laughs> Where the Baron keeps getting younger during the making of the film, she got very much older. <laughs> she was about 45 when it was over. Coming back. I've, I've been stuck here for over 20 years. Ever since you were last here on... There's something about this shot that I always loved, and it was John's profile there, this nose and chin. It's in the fact, jutting chin. Yeah. Is good, yeah. And he gives nothing. He does nothing. He just, just keeps looking. Well, Eric goes, wacko. And expect me to follow you to the ends of the earth. Yes. <laughs> it's a nice moment. <laughs> we had lots of trouble. In the early storyboards, I think there was a, an orrery being built. And somewhere late in the day, the idea of doing this, uh, this cosmic stellar orrery I can't remember when it came in, but it, true, it proved to be really difficult because you're dealing with pixels, you're dealing with tiny things that the software at that point didn't, wasn't able to deal with what we were trying to do with these these um, um, fish or constellations swimming around. The Zodiac. The Zodiac, thank you for that, yeah. And it proved to be a nightmare to do this. And it looks quite straightforward and simple, but it proved to be very, very hard. And the moon was just this bit of, again, polystyrene with some steps on it that we could <laughs> swing them off. I think what was really extraordinary is getting people like John, who was at this point in his 70s, I think. No. His 60s. Yeah. Oh, he was much younger. Okay, and then he could do all this stunt work. Good, because uh, I'm in my 60s. I could do that. <laughs> I thought he was a much more older man. Uh, be early 60s. The early 60s. I mean, he, a young man is what you're really saying. He's he a young man. He, he was just, he got into the part to such <sighs> an extent that, you know, we thought... Well, I, I don't feel sorry for him at all anymore. No. <laughs> yeah. He kept moaning the whole time. I like the logic of this. Naturally, where else do you think I get it from? It makes such sense. <laughs> And because, you know, so much of what we were dealing with here was the difference between levity and gravity. And, and, well put, sir. <laughs> and, and the double meanings of those words. <laughs> it's funny looking at some of the effects. They really did. This shot, getting the globe like that and getting that smoke just so was magical. Mm. It took ages because there's a weird heat inversion in the studio that we got that allowed us to get the smoke just right. It was all accidental, most of it. But off we went, and we got that shot. The Cyclops, I love this, this, this them protesting over the... And Ollie was not playing Vulcan up until the very last moment. We had no Vulcan because Thomas had spent so much time uh, trying to lure... Marlon Brando into the part. And then Lee Cleary, who was the second assistant, uh, or third maybe, he said he'd worked with Ollie on a film recently, and, and he said, you ought to work with him. And we got him at the very last moment, and I just, I just think he's wonderful. Yeah. 
I mean, he's so dangerous and so frightening and so funny all at the same time. Wow. Oh, no. Not more giants. Can I help you try any more rules? And this is one of John's best readings of a line. I'm uh, Baron Munchausen. You may have heard of me. My friends <laughs> I think that is there. just spectacular. <laughs> and Ollie, what was interesting is that John held Ollie in such high esteem, and I think Ollie felt the same about John. And the two of them together in these scenes, I think John is sparkling almost more than anywhere else in the movie. Mm -hmm. There's just... What was always intriguing was that we would rehearse at the end of the day, the next day's work, and Ollie was beyond spectacular. And then when it came to do it the next day, he was... He, he had tightened up a bit. He, it was a bit of nerves or something it took over. And it's still spectacular, but what I'd seen in those, you know, those performances during the rehearsal was just unbelievable. And I can't remember which point we decided the idea of Vulcan being sort of a, a, a northerner, an industrial, a Victorian character. Was that Ollie's idea? I can't remember. No, no, it was ours. I think it was, wasn't it? I can't remember. I think so, because it was something about, uh, you know, muck and uh, yeah. brass and all and, and all that. Just... It, it Built into the dialogue. Yeah. Exactly. It worked much better. All the time, me! You know, in the old days, the stuff used to get paid on the dot every thousand years. This stuff expect the memory century. He was just a good old Victorian industrialist, is what he was. <laughs> yeah. Oh, this is our prototype. Rx, uh, intercontinental. I don't think this was rasp. I think we were now moving into political commentary. Ah. What does it do? Do. Kills the enemy. All the enemy? Aye, ah, all of them. All their wives and all their children and all their sheep and all their cattle and all their cats and dogs. All of them. There's something about his little dance. He's, he's just breathtaking. And again, little moments like this is all him. Advantages. You don't have to see one single one of them die. You just sit comfortably thousands of miles away. And I kind of want Ollie to be alive to tell me tales. Yeah. It's just like... He'd be the most wonderful sort of uncle-grandfather character to take you and tell you a grim tale. It would be just so completely, you know, enthralling yeah. and terrifying and wonderful. <laughs> he, just, he just is so funny. And he, yeah. if you look at his career, there's only been about three films where he's been allowed to be funny. His comic timing is just breathtaking. Delicious. Ah. Ah, it's not a bad drop of tea. And this is one of Dante's most, you know, outrageous sets. All mere and beautiful stuff. And the idea in the midst, midst of this great uh, foundry. <laughs> this refinement. <laughs> exactly. And I think this is all about, this is Venus's doing yes. somehow. She's pro she brought out the best in him, or what he thinks she would like. Or the worst. It. Yeah, exactly. As she accuses him later of being a petty bourgeois. But this, he would have done it all for his great love, Venus. Baron, Lord, what are you doing here? Looking for you. And I love Winston being put in this situation. This is one of the most butch, macho guys in the world. And suddenly he gets to be delicate. This is Sally. Sally Albrecht. Hello. I want you to. What I used to love is that Winston and Karen Shaw, who. Uh, plays the you know the executioner's assistant, and he doubled for Sally. Kieran being about what three foot ten tall, and Winston being six foot five or something like this, and the two of them shaved bald, wearing the sleekest Italian suits they had just bought in Rome, and going to all the cool clubs. It was a great sight in Rome. <laughs> the two of them, the freak show come to town. <laughs> And then this was the day that Uma's mother was on the phone trying to get her to go back and get her high school diploma, finish high school. 
And, and I said, too late, Uma. We've got your clothes off. You're a fallen woman. It's all over. And poor Uma had never done anything like this. You know, the set was cleared of all but the most essential uh, technicians. And this being her first real film, she didn't understand to look up. It was a, probably a wise thing because the entire crew was up in the rigging. <laughs> That clam shell was a nightmare because it, it wouldn't get rid of the water. It the first attempts at pulling it up, it, it was so waterlogged it wouldn't come out. We got slipped further and further behind with that, but it was all worth it. There's an image that uh, is worth the price of admission. And I thought I was being very bold by having her look straight at the camera because I knew it'd have an effect, not just on the others, and, but it has on the audience. I remember when the film first came out and there'd be sort of young men in the audience and when Uma comes on, looking right at them, they all were almost embarrassed to look. They were so <laughs> caught in the act of lusting after her. A long-limbed gal. Oh. And Ollie is at his finest here, shameless. And then we were doing the cheap, you know, cheap, awful gags when he's pulling things out of his trousers. Excuse me, may I introduce you to Baron Munchausen? And he's... Uh... I mean, he was a constant surprise. I mean, like, the way he delivered these lines. Mm -hmm. And Bird told <laughs> this laugh. I mean, this was all his doing. This is uh, Venus. The goddess. <laughs> my wife. And I love going from the silliness of that, the embarrassment to then, my wife. <laughs> Terrifying. Oh, oh my, my love, my life, the alpha, the amazing. This is me, just another cheap thing, you know, pulling something out of his trousers. It turns out to be a piece of coal, luckily. <laughs> Again, safe for children. And I love his embarrassment and not being able to do it quite immediately. <laughs> and I think Uma is quite wonderful, mm. incredibly imperious, and just talking down to him. It's quite extraordinary. There's Ollie at you know in his late fifties. There's Uma at seventeen, and they make a wonderful couple. <laughs> I think Ollie wanted to make it a more wonderful couple than it was when the camera wasn't turning. You so splendid a gift. But allow me to say that you excel in beauty, even the magnificent. This set was actually a nightmare to shoot on. I don't know if you remember because all of the, the mirrors, it's all mirrored. We ended up having to spray everything so you don't see us constantly being reflected. And each of these pieces, the mirrors and all, could be moved slightly so you'd have to angle each one. So every shot took ages to put together to keep the reflections out, to keep the camera out. It was a real nightmare set to work on, especially with the cow in it. Um, and then they stuck Uma on a dolly so she doesn't walk. She floats. Which uh, is very nice. That shot really works very well because the camera's moving, she's moving, everything is just shifting again. Mm. It's those moments when she leap from reality. And so they're both on it, just floating towards the ballroom. Come and see the ballroom. <laughs> So we keep shifting from a kind of reality and beautiful to cartoons. It's it, cartoons are never far behind. Come and see the ballroom. Come and see the ballroom. I mean, the man has got such extraordinary power on the screen. Utter, he's terrifying. And then we came to the, the dance. What basically happened, again, to save money, we had the, the remnants of the uh, of Dante's set, of the library for, uh, um, what's the thing, the Rose? It was Sean Connery. Oh, name uh, of the Rose. Name of the Rose, yeah. He had built this huge library set, and it was still standing in the back lot of, 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 of Chitty Chita. And so we just adapted it and pumped in a lot of water 
And what's intriguing is we use the same set for both the live action Baron and Venus and the model. And it seems to work. You can't quite tell the difference. Yeah. I can dance. Yeah. Watch this. And Jean and Uma were on this platform that we would raise up and down amongst uh, various parts of the set. The fountains were a result of having originally wanted to do this sequence of the, the Villa d'Este in Tivoli, which was all these extraordinary fountains, and then only again after months of planning told we couldn't shoot there. But it's part of what's interesting about having worked in Rome that the difficulties created ideas that we then incorporated. Yeah, yeah. And Ali's funniest moment is <laughs> this <laughs> deep inside of this monster is sort of <laughs> something sweet and fairy like wanting to burst out my cat. <laughs> and the best he can do is this, this absurd. And I can't remember why the cow is in there, but it's all of these things, I don't know, they seem to be at the time interesting ideas, so let's throw them in. <laughs> Do you remember why the cow was in there? No. No, I don't know. <laughs> we built these gigantic candelabra that we could then hoist in and, and uh, <laughs> fill in the foreground. But again, I love the idea of the Baron when he's in love with Venus, they fly into the air. That's what it always feels like when you're in love and, 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 and fl you get floaty. Did the model shot, how long did that, was that one night or was it longer? The model was actually, again, I think it was just one night. And this was David Tomlin uh, who saved the day, who uh, basically got everybody to agree that we could do it in one night. Is the crew, I think by this point, we're now working for free. It was at the very end of the shoot in Rome and the money was gone and everybody was so loyal to the project that they somehow gave a free night and we had to go and shoot the model. There were attempts at the model before that had failed miserably, but there was this one last chance, and that's what's there. I uh, remember there being uh, difficulties with the model. I can't remember the precise Well, one of the sequence. big problems is the model was built by uh, a, a, a man who obviously didn't know how to dance because he had Venus leading. The hands were the wrong way around. The left hand, you know, should be out, mm. as it is. The Baron's left hand. And it was done the wrong way around. And we had to get that remade. So there was a lot of work before the actual shoot of discovering, you know, the person doing the work had never waltzed in his life. But ultimately the thing really worked and he's on wires and there's, and there's movement in the legs and everything. Yeah. And we managed to get it. That's enough of that, you stupid! But none of these sets were easy, and when you're pumping that much water in and you've got all this mechanical gear, everything is going wrong most of the time. Yeah. I don't know if this was, you know, naivete on my part. Uh, it was just that it's a terrible thing if you're not ambitious and not naive, you don't even try these things. And it does take a lot out of everybody else, and, and everything goes wrong, but you know, hopefully in the end you've got something that you've never seen before. And there was so much of this stuff that was physical rather than, it was before computer generated imagery, so we were having to do the stuff. Yeah. I mean, these sequences here took ages to set up. There was so much difficulty getting everything. A lot of times things weren't working there. This, this swirl pool was an utter, complete nightmare. But we finally got it going. And this was, I think, the day when we were about to do this scene that having now been through several first uh, assistant directors and this, the best Italian first named Johnny Conso had come on after we'd started up shooting again after the break. Uh, and he had had, uh, I think, a double or triple or quadruple bypass. And he was on for a few weeks. And 
during this sequence, he said, that's it, I'm gone, I'm not going to die on this film, and he quit. Because um, Ali, Ali went a bit crazy this day for whatever reason, and, and Johnny actually touched him and said, come on, on the set. And Ali went a little bit mad, and Johnny said, that's it, I'm out of here. But what was wonderful this day is that Ali came in in the morning and said, could I do this? And he did this. <laughs> and I said, yes, <laughs> you must do that. Suddenly, these little, these little cow eyes blinking, batting like a child. And I thought, absolutely brilliant stuff. And I, I, I just wish he had had a few more films to show just how brilliantly comic he was. Yeah. I can't remember when we decided the Welsh choir should come in. It's like we're looking at an opera now. <laughs> it's, all like, it's now we're on a fairground ride, I think. People falling. I love this idea, and I remember it was from a photograph I had seen, the people in the water, and it had been inverted. So, and that's what we did. And what was so difficult for all the stunt people doing this was try to stay below the water. Because all it is is the camera's upside down. Yeah. But I thought, it, it just has an amazing effect, that. And then, oop, we're upside down. Of course, that's what happens when you, when you go through the center of the Earth. It seems reasonable. It's just, I love the fact that, like, people's heads haven't uh, accommodated the new gravity yet. <laughs> And we were in this swimming pool. It wasn't even a proper tank. It was in Chinichita. Uh, no, it was outside. It was in Rome, but it wasn't in Chinichita. I don't know why the tank wasn't deep enough or something. So we ended up in this swimming pool, and oh, and you've got all these actors in wet suits, and it's so painful and difficult and cold. It's amazing that you get anything done. Mm -hmm. Because you spend most of your time just getting people into the water, getting them in position, and then, oh, you're lucky if you get a shot. Anybody who's ever worked on water realizes this is not the thing to do. Now, this we shot back in, in London in the Bond stage, and, and um, again, which we flooded. Huge painted backdrop and this uh, monster. I think of this... Around this point, I was really beginning to think one should never do physical effects because moving this thing through the water was a nightmare. It never did quite what it was supposed to do. And you end up shooting so much material for the little bit you actually do use. The advantage of computer graphics is you can control all that stuff much more. But there are moments... How is it, it Is it pneumatic? What's the... Yeah, it's just a great big, you know, fish on a, a track underwater. And again, trying to move it through the water was so difficult because you've got this... It's not, you know, aerodynamically designed. And it would snag and... And because it's rubber, it was all... And we're moving in these very impossible ways that a creature wouldn't. And we were on this huge tank. But when you do something like that, I don't think you would achieve that result with a, with a computer-generated no. image. There's something about it. You know it's real. Yeah. But, I mean, we shot for... I, I can't remember how many months once we got back to London and we built this you know, interior of the whale, which was about... Uh, it's probably about 12 feet long. Uh, the model. This is on the stage in Chinichita. By this point in the film, I think everybody was so tired, and now we're asking you to climb into terrible, you know, wet situations. It was miserable. It kind of felt like what it felt like, I mean, this point in the making of the film. Everybody was worn out, tired, fed up. <laughs> And these sets were really difficult to work within. I think at this point, we were so far behind schedule, we were just trying to 
we weren't able to plan things in advance, what the camera's going to do, where it's going to be, so you couldn't build in the tracks. And it was just that you would arrive on the set that day and we were just putting the last bits of touch-up paint on them and how we're going to get the camera and how we're going to move. Uh, all of the planning that had gone on beforehand was kind of thrown out the window and you were just trying to get through each day's work. I think the thing that people don't really know is that up until the 50s, Munchausen was the second best-selling book in the world after the Bible. It was known to one and all. It was part of our culture, and then it fell through the cracks, and nobody knows. And here was our chance to reintroduce a great book to a, an illiterate public. Well, in the German-speaking world, anyway, wasn't it? Was it as popular in non-German-speaking? No, yeah, I'm talking about in the entire world. It was yeah. huge. In America, in the 50s, was a radio show with a, a catchphrase, Was you there, Charlie? At the end of each episode, when the Baron would have finished his story and he would be asked with some doubt whether it was true, and he says, was you there, Charlie? Yeah. So, no, it was a very big success, and then it went away. Again, this is our attempt to encourage people to go back and rediscover books. They're much better than movies. Yeah. And I think this movie really made sure people quit the theater in large numbers and went back, hopefully, to books. There is a great actor. Now, how do we get him in the film? And that's the thing, when you're actually get to getting that level of talent into a film, then I know you've... I thought that was sense. somebody you picked up off the street, basically. And no, no, that's a performance by one of the oh, famous Monty Python members. Oh. Mm, little known one, the one you don't normally see. Mm -hmm. I think the others kept him always away because he was just such an outstanding talent oh. that it would put them in. Oh. The Understandable show. when you see that, of course. Yeah, I know. Okay. I don't think there was a whole music career that was being offered up after, just on the basis of that. There were many albums being sought. Hmm. Interesting. But, um, unfortunately, other people, and, well, he was cut out of the film, actually. You know, he does go on. He dies in the, in yeah. the film. But that part was cut out, I think. Probably the insistence of these actors here who were being upstaged. The golfers. Good stuff. Is it really you? Your... Old man is just wonderful, and I don't know... How did you talk me into that voice? <laughs> Probably by that stage, I couldn't have done any other voice. Eh? <laughs> and I was that was all the voice I had left. <laughs> you think that's a performance? <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yeah, I was, I think, so exhausted by then. No, they're just cutting through the whole thing. Oh, God, it was getting so good. <laughs> Those were the days. Shall I just translate what you're saying? Need subtitles, dear David. <laughs> we were talking about that at one point, weren't we, of putting subtitles? Because yeah. you were determined not to alter your character in, in any way. Well, I assumed we would have subtitles here. Right? Well, luckily, you know, in foreign countries, we did have subtitles, so they know what's going on in this scene. But I love that voice. And I was, you know suckered into letting you do it because we all just thought it was so clever at the time. He said, my God, this guy's yeah. brilliant and brave. And, yeah, uh, it's always a mistake to fall for people laughing behind the camera. I know. Usually when you're enjoying yourself making a film, it turns out to be a bad film. Yeah. We were all laughing, having a wonderful time. But luckily we were having a miserable time making this film, and that's why it's so great today. Exactly. I think many lives were sacrificed for the enjoyment of the audience. This is really, I think, my daughters trying to keep me... I was feeling that I was an old man then. I was feeling the age of, of Munchausen. And it was only having children that sort of kept me going. So we can blame my children for this film. That's fair. Yeah. They're old enough now to take it. Michael's score is quite lovely, and a death-dealing poker game is pretty exciting. You horrible little brat! It was interesting, I remember on the day, trying to get John to be angry enough to manhandle this child. He's such a gentleman, he didn't want to do it. And I thought, come on, John. How did you goad him into... Performing. Well, I said we were going to be even another month later in the shooting and he would never get back to Ontario to his 
beloved theatre. And it worked. Now I'm really beginning to wonder what's going on. I mean, the old mates are turning up, horses are turning up on the surface. Where was this horse all along? How was it swallowed by a whale? What were they doing on a boat that got them swallowed by this whale? This is a, a good omen, what? Oh, oh yeah, yeah. I think what's interesting now is when we suddenly hear a line from the beginning of the film with Bill Patterson on stage. I have learned from experience a modicum of snuff. And I hope the audience remembers how it ties together. How we saw one whale, and now we're inside a real whale. I love Sarah, that's very sweet. <laughs> and it's like some great big grouper fish. <laughs> I think what's interesting is I hope it's clear to the audience, which I've never been certain about, is whether all this turmoil inside leads leads to the uh, water spout and everybody going high in the air. Do you think that makes sense? Yeah. Well, I mean, it does look good. Yeah. I can relax now. Yeah, definitely. Okay. I think that's one of the clearest moments in the movie. Excellent. I just have these moments of doubt always. It's shocking no, when you no, watch no. something. Rest yeah? assured. Really? This is what you said, I remember, when we started the whole pro uh, project, that it was going to be fine and easy. You lied to me then. Now we're Only on... Only a bit. <laughs> <laughs> we were on the, the tank now in the back of Chinichita, which we actually had rebuilt just for this film. We spent a lot of time you know, seducing the studio into rebuilding itself um, because we were being, uh, we were making the most expensive film ever since Cleopatra. And so they did rebuild the tank. I love this moment. This was one of the, the effects team pulled it off with that horse because it's, you know, it's a mechanical horse, but he looks pretty good. Mm. And there's water coming out of its snout. And that's a real horse at that point. Now it got very difficult when we actually had to use the real horse in his hammock, hoisting him high in the air with a, a stunt man on board. But it works. It's very interesting how we were in the back lot on this set for a long time with all our sunken ships. It was constantly having to redress this tank. But it seems to work. Yeah. And what happened when we were in Almeria is that we again, we put all those masts in the water, but uh, a gale blew up and washed them all away. But at this point, at least we're in the safety of the tank. Except when we did this scene on the boat. Do you remember um, when the cannonballs go off and the horse is supposed to leap off? It all went terribly wrong. Yeah, and we uh, uh, debt of gratitude to the brilliant stuntman who was riding a horse at that time who immediately jumped off the boat so it wouldn't fall backwards, as I recall. Mm. I can't remember what, what caused it to go so terribly wrong, but it did. I think it, it was startled by the... the explosion. Explosion. Yeah, and I think I think and this is a memory of that Sarah really thought she was as good as dead. And the, when the boat rocked, there were there were swell there was swell from the explosions, and the boat rocked, and the horse lost its balance. Yeah. And it could have come back, but he took it off the front. Yeah. It's interesting because it's the only shot we've got of the whole thing happening because we didn't go back and reshoot it because everybody was so terrorized, and that's the moment of the the horse coming off. And it was, wasn't framed properly because we weren't ready for it. <laughs> but we got it. And then I think in the end, I just felt, because Sarah was so shocked by the whole thing, we're not going to go any further. We're not going to do another take. It was probably the only time I was uh, decent to, towards the crew and the cast. And here we are in Almeria. I've always found this an amazing feeling when the first time I saw the film, and suddenly we're back in the real world and everything is real there. Mm. 
because we've been we've been lured away into this this fanciful world shot on you know blue screen on stages with strange sets and suddenly we're back in the real world in the water and it looks it looks just great I was surprised at the effect that had on me when I saw it the first time cut together. Because mm. you can't fake this stuff. Now, if we begin attacking in two directions simultaneously, we can found some... This was funny when I saw it. What was it? It was the second um, Indiana Jones. Or the one, maybe it's the third one, the one with Sean Connery. Because they came down here after us and shot in this very same bay. I think they used it for one shot. We... <laughs> We got down there, and this gale came up, and literally, we had all those masts in the water. We had many more, and they were washed away. The tents were washed, uh, blown away. It was a complete mayhem. The irony was that then later we have to create our own hurricanes as Gustavus blows, and we had to use wind machines. The minute we wanted to be calm and sensible, nature was attacking us. If you want to see Baron Munchausen again, you'd better do something about it. You can't give yourself up. The great tower, the big uh, war tower, Dante builds everything for real. And we had to build a road under the sand to support those things because they wouldn't move. In the end, we, we got one that could move slightly. <laughs> and the other <laughs> was rigid. The cannons, once again, they were built so heavily that they couldn't move. Everything was sinking into the sand. And, and we ended up in a situation where you couldn't easily maneuver anything. So the camera and the people moved and the objects were rigid. <laughs> Stuck. This was the day when John finally cracked because we got down there. He was four hours in makeup, came on the set, and he was an 80-year-old man. And as is supposed to be, as is supposed to be, uh, I can't speak. My, my mouth is still full of embarrassment and shame that it's tying itself in knots. And it was the only time he really went a little bit dulale, and I don't blame him. And he, he had to go back after having spent four hours in makeup, go back and spend another four hours which will guarantee a world fit for science, progress, and... But not Baron Munchausen! Baron! You... you old lunatic! I'm afraid so! Oh, God! Murder! But again, what was interesting, you can always see the tent billowing all the time, shooting. It was these terrible winds that were blowing. It's yours. I'm tired of it. Send for the executioner! So, Mr. Jackson... It was a hard shoot down there. Uh, it was a brilliant location. I remember what we discovered was the, the benefits of making margaritas to get us through the nights. Remember, we were stuck in this little hotel in San Jose and everything. I think we were worn out. This was now the third week of shooting and we were already exhausted at that point and everybody was despairing. And, and uh, we learned to make margaritas to get through the evening. I remember you coming back uh, after the day shoot black from the burning tires that were uh, it, the bonfires of burning tires on the beach. <laughs> This shot, we came down with a thing, this crane, this techno crane, it was the latest model that had this big extendable arm. And we had all these extras, elephants, horses, everything in their monster shot. And the crane wouldn't work. It was supposed to have this extendable arm. And the, in fact, the arm was rigid. And we did this pullback, uh, just moving fast with all the extras stepping in to cover the track. It was... Uh, an extraordinary shot because horses were moving and at one point on one of the takes we got all the way to the back end with the cannons in the foreground heard this awful noise and realized the elephants had stampeded they were at the far distance and it was chaos down there and that was my beginning to question everything technological at this point I think the elephants turned against your second unit director, didn't they? That poor Michele Suave didn't get on with the, the elephants. With the... No, there was something that happened. Michele was 
a young director I'd met at a film festival in, in, in Brussels, actually, and he had made his first film, and he was a big fan, and, and we needed a second unit director, and so we got Michele to come. He was Roman anyway, and he, he took over, and he, he was stuck with dealing with his very difficult typical business. It's interesting that business with the horse right there because the horses we had trained for three months weren't able to turn up and uh, the stuntman is such a bri brilliant rider. He got on that horse with no training and leapt, twisted, turned, did everything you could ever dream of you could do with a horse. He was like a centaur. He was like the yeah. front half. It was of the like half. all one creature, wasn't it? He was yeah. absolutely brilliant. Truly amazing and he really saved us. So now we're having to create our own hurricanes. Through much of this stuff, this is again Michaeli's work, having to shoot all this. I don't know where we were by now, because at a certain point we left uh, and moved on to Saragossa, <laughs> leaving Michaeli behind to deal with things. And everything had gone so wrong. The only thing that seemed to be wonderful on the production at this point were the elephants, who seemed to be innocent, beautiful, pure creatures. And there was one day when everything had gone as wrong as could go wrong, and I saw them bathing in the, the sea at the end of the day. And I just left the set running away like a madman, jumped on the back of one and said, go to Africa now, <laughs> get out of here. One just felt so much of the time, it just, it was like all the forces of nature and, and all the gods that ever were, were against us. I've got to give credit to this stuntman, and who I'm trying to remember right now, it was Angelo Raguzzo, was this? I think might have been his name. He just was brilliant, and if I could only see, I could read it. But for the moment, it's Angelo Raguzzo who gets all the credit until I find something uh, more accurate. It's awful how much we've forgotten. Angelo was the man. Angelo was the man. We have documentary proof that J Angelo was the man. It's good when memory does serve one occasionally. This rig for um, Bertolt's running was a nightmare because they had to rig it on this hillside at the beach and we had this mechanized figure that wiggled and did all sorts of things. And it had to be shot again and again and again. And again, I think we left them behind. We had, we, we had done these background plates of rushing through the crowds for Eric. And, and the angle was slightly wrong. And we ended up uh, in the Perilous Camera afterwards, Kent Houston did this weird bend and, and, and put this, this keystone shape on it. And it looks fantastic. It's, it looks much better than what we originally planned to do. Eric was then shot on a green screen or blue screen, whichever, it doesn't matter, on uh, a treadmill. So he's running like mad with this um, ball, the, the, the bullet, on, on a little wire spinning around in front of him. Damn it, man, make yourself useful. I can't do everything. Oh. Now, these sequences here, David Tomlin, who was the first assistant director somewhere along the line, you can see his marks on it because always in the background there's things going on. There's horses moving across the horizon. It's, it's just... He's brilliant. Everybody thought I was mad doing this sequence, how the Baron starts going in a circle faster and faster, and suddenly there's three Barons, one right after another. And Salvatore, my driver, was doubling for John Neville and was put on this, this fiberglass horse that was on a, a spinning device. And he was a, he was a great horseman. And this was his moment of glory. And he was stuck on that thing, strapped on it, and then the spinning started. And the poor man was reduced to just jelly because he was so sick, he was vomiting. <laughs> and it was, it was such a cruel thing to do to my own driver. <laughs> but it was probably revenge for him having taken off the, the beautiful linen seat covers he had, had made specially for his car oh, until he saw me. That was the reason. That was it, because he saw I got on board, he was driving the director, he'd done these new seat covers, and as usual, I was looking like some scruffy gypsy. Right. And after the first week, he removed the seat covers, so he had to be punished. The elephants were quite 
brilliant. It was his family, uh, this gypsy family, that, that was their livelihood, these three elephants, and the children played with them. The elephants would lie with the children. Uh, it was breathtaking. They were great. Our bigger problem was with the tiger, which was uh, never turned up, it seemed. And then finally it did turn up, and it was in this little van. And this was the man's livelihood, this tiger. And I was outside with Jose Luis, the first AD, and suddenly this noise from inside and he screams and the tiger came flying out the, the tent at about, about six feet off the ground. It was a flying tiger. Jose leaped about eight feet through the air into my arms as this poor tiger was rampaging around the camp and everybody in an absolute panic. And all the tiger did was want to get away from the film and everybody associated with it. I think uh, Jose ran to you, didn't he? He uh, leapt into my arms. He leapt into your arms. Yeah, I mean, he actually, he, like the tiger, flew. <laughs> and uh, I didn't know my own strength, but I could actually carry a first Spanish assistant. He was a small man. <laughs> The ending, we used to have a much more elaborate ending. This was where our original scene was with the horse chasing after the Turkish army, right. the baron on it, and, and reaching the town before the army and uh, being cut in half, which was, I think I said earlier, was the scene that I wanted to do most of all, of all the Rasp stories, and it was the first one we cut out. Mm. But this ending seemed to work fine. We didn't need all of that. <laughs> I love this band. It was a real band. Great instruments, great people. And I look at these shots and I say, God, we had a big budget to do this. It was really spectacular. And again, it was at the end of the day because it took everything all day long to get everything together. And luckily, the light was just catching the one building, Horatio Jackson's office building. Originally, we used to, at the end of um, the battle, all of you sort of looked at each other and said, we did it, we actually did it ourselves, and you all collapsed. And you were originally carried in, exhausted, but we trimmed that out. But now we repeat the shot from early on when we pull back from Sally at the base of the statue at the beginning of the film, and here we are once again. The shadow of death is upon us. Only this time it's the evil Jonathan Price. This is, again, something you don't normally do in a children's film. Kill the main character. <laughs> but this is our homage to um, November 22nd, uh, my birthday, and also the death of JFK, wasn't it? It was... That's what I had in the back of my head, was the awful the assassination of JFK. I don't know what you were thinking. <laughs> and there it is. Yeah. Lee Harvey <laughs> Jackson. <laughs> Death ar arriving out of that worked rather nicely. It's, yeah. a good, it's a great effect. It's terrifying. And again, it was a little model we shot um, back here in London. And Imperialist did quite a good job of combining all the elements of breaking stone and brick falling and, um, and our little model. And I love Death's appearance. This fantastic Spanish actor with the most... most horrible face. I mean, he's a lovely man, but it was such a strange, dark face, which we did a bit of work on. Oh, doctor. Mm. 
I love our kind of his soul, the death's hands uh, pulling out this, this strange kind of a floaty. I'm not sure what a soul looks like, but I thought this was reasonable. If you're going to have one, it ought to be a nice sort of greeny color. Plasma. Plasma, that's it. It's ectoplasma. It's ectoplasma. Look at that. And the strange thing about it, we were in Belchita here, and we had to dig a hole for the, um, the mechanics of death. And what we discovered were the bones of people in the Civil War down there. Human bones wow. were there, so we actually had chosen a place of, of death for death. These are the strange forces that are working behind this film. Now, does anybody notice what it says on the, on the, um, the base of the statue here? Lies Baron Munchausen. Is that a clue? Uh, maybe. Which meaning of the word should we follow? Yeah. Okay. Well, it's just, this is for the DVD viewers, because I think the normal cinema goers probably missed that one, but for people paying the big bucks needed to buy the DVD should, you know, get a little extra. Alison Stedman is a great actress and who was horribly underused by this film. It's majestic, this. Mm -hmm. It's a bit of Mozart. It's, uh, it's his requiem that we basically were stealing. <laughs> that was only one of the many occasions on which I met my death. An experience... Which I don't Wait a minute. Hesitate. I thought we were in sort of a tragedy and suddenly we're back in this cheap theatrical presentation. I don't know what to believe in anymore, Charles. I know. I mean, we're being just played with all the time. The audience is being played with. And I don't think that's right. No, it's... It, it... Happily ever after. What nonsense is Why don't people grow up? The world isn't like that. No, we don't that. know what to think now, do we, really? No, I, I know. I, 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 if I hadn't paid good money, I probably would have walked out at this point. Yeah. But I'd also spent like, a couple hours of my life, and I'm not going to leave yet until I find out just what more terrible things they've got in store for us. But uh, I remember at the time, the audiences had left long before this moment, so they, weren't, they were spared this part. Because when we were first... Screening this thing in America, literally, there were huge walkouts. Really? Yeah, the studio got very, very nervous about the whole thing. And um, and they made sure that there were less walkouts when they actually released the film by, in fact, releasing it in so few theaters that, uh, that uh, most people didn't get a chance to walk out. Well, that was smart. I think so. I think uh, they're wise in those ways. Uh, they only showed it to people that would like it. But the nice thing about the film, it does seem to have longevity. And, you know, walking around as one does in public places and occasionally people come up to me having recognized me as, you know, John Cleese or Michael Palin, and they say, you know, the favorite film of theirs, of all films that, that John or Mike have ever done, is uh, Baron Munchausen. I think we're almost moving into metaphysical territory here. I mean, opening the gates, what are we talking about? Are these the famous doors of perception? That kind of gateway? Fair comment. Okay, is it, are we, are anything to fear is fear itself? Is that sort of thing a Churchillian moment? Now this, is this, is this a Bill Patterson moment? Did he ad-lib this speech? Did he force it upon us, this Shakespearean thing? Or did you write that? No, this looks... Increasingly like a Bill Patterson moment to me. I know, I know. I think he wanted that moment, because originally he just opened the gates and he demanded that he get his moment in the spotlight before the film was over. Yeah. Again, this is very anti-authoritarian, which I don't think we should be encouraging in this day and age. No. Look, at there's the elected leader and nobody's paying attention to him. They're laughing at him, jeering at him. Luckily, that doesn't happen in the real world. No. And, oh, that was Donald Rumsfeld who just got hit, wasn't it? You're right. Somebody has to take the blame. And then we open the door. And has it all been a dream? Has it all been an illusion? Were we 
ever under threat? Are there terrorists in the world, we ask ourselves, or is it just an illusion to maintain power? Oh, well, it must have been the battle's over. There was a battle fought, clearly. So they must have been there at some point, the Turks. But they are no longer there. But they were there. They were there. And it was only because of Homeland Security that they're no longer there. Is that it? I'm not sure what we're saying at this point in the film, Charles. We did know, though, didn't we, at the time we made it? We knew, but we're older men now, and you yeah. know, Alzheimer's is kicking in. Yes, and we can't, we can't hang on to it. We have, we've lost the grip, really. I know. I hope somewhere in the rest of the DVD, some of the other people that are being interviewed will you know, remember what we were doing at this point in the film, and or why we were doing it. Beautiful ladies. Beautiful. See, this was the beginning of Uma's career. Has she ever thanked us for it? Not me. No, I don't think she's thanked me either. She's... They've moved on. I think we're just yesterday's men. But you're looking young there. And look at that. Look at that profile. That's a, well, it's almost a profile. It's a different person. I know. Sarah Polly is a, is a film director now. Not only is she a fine actress, but she's directed her first film this year. And that horse went on to... Um, a glue, wasn't it? Because it glue didn't he become very fine. <laughs> I think I know. I know. Is it? <laughs> you must. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> uh, but it's a happy ending for so many of the characters in the film. <laughs> and the horse's last moment, and he's gone. Gone. And he's probably sticking envelopes together today. <laughs> in his own way. I like these, and the people come down, it's like in the theater. They all step forward for a bow. They all have their moment. It's interesting the order of, of importance in this film. Ollie's fourth, you are fifth. Winston Emmett is sixth. Long, you're getting credit far, far in advance of Valentina, a special appearance by her, or Jonathan, a major lead uh, actor. Isn't that the second time we've seen Bill Patterson in the he credits? <laughs> Played possibly. I know. Bill was sort of the male Valentina, I like to think. If he could get into the center of the frame, he would. See, Ray DiTuto, King of the Moon. I think very few people have gone on to greatness after this. I think Uma should be billed at the top of the whole list. Yeah, thing, yeah, yeah, definitely. Sell it shamelessly on well, on Uma Thurman. Yeah, yeah, the film that made her who she is today. But the rest of us are, I think, forgotten, except for Maggie West. And there's my wife. That feels good when you see your wife get a credit. Do you realize this film was nominated for four Academy Awards? Four. Uh, one of them being... Maggie Weston for the makeup. In spite of Eric's wig. Exactly. And then there was Dante Ferretti. Yeah. Design. There was Gabriella Piscucci for... Um, costume. Costume. And who was the fourth one? Special effects. Richard Conway. Richard Conway? Indeed. And all of them lost. Every one of them. I mean, if I work with losers, this is why my career is in the state it is today. Yeah. <sighs> It's too sad. It is. I mean, it would have been better if they weren't nominated. Then nobody would realize they were losers. But once you're nominated, once you're dragged up in front of the public, and then you fail. You're doomed. You're doomed. And then they dragged me down, and, and I dragged you down. Yeah. But we, this is probably the last chance we'll ever be able to speak to the public. So is there anything you'd like to say to the public that used to know you and like you and respect you? Um... Uh, uh, oh, thank you, oh, Charles. Um, right. I would like to say, though, on behalf of my family and everybody involved in the making of this film, what a joy it has been working with you, Charles. You've always been a great wordsmith. Uh, when it comes to words, you are the man. Are you still here? Uh, I'm lost for words, really. 
Oh, thank you very much. But I do want to say it was a joy working with you when you were young and compass mentis. When you were useful, when I felt a partner in joy and pleasure and and, and creativity. But now, the <laughs> yeah, I know the car is coming soon. Don't worry, it'll be here. It'll be here. Michele Suave has gone on to be quite a successful director for television and other films. Yes. He worked with uh, Rupert Everett years ago. Mm-hmm. Yeah, called Cemetery Man in English. <laughs> it was called that. It was, it was, yes, another great loss. But do you realize how many people involved in this film are no longer with us on this planet? How do you mean? Dead. Dead, Charles. Dead, I'm talking about. That's very blunt. I know. I think we can't beat around the bush anymore. These people died, and I think they died to try to give something to the public. And the public, uh, do they care? Do they care about what people do for them? To try to entertain them? To try to inspire them? No, they just go and buy their discs, and they sit in in their comfy little rooms watching this thing and probably being very, very, very picky about lots of scenes that they don't like that could have been better. Too late. I hate them all. (laughs) 